Um, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Oh Lord, thank you so much for your blessings. Thank you for this, this church and, and thank you for guiding it and walking with it. It's the most spirit-led church I've ever been affiliated with. We can feel your presence here and with us. We ask that you use us, O oh Lord, to make a difference for you in this world. We pray for those people that are hurting, that are suffering. We ask that you bring peace to them. We ask that you guide the caretakers, the doctors, the nurses, the family that are to watch over these people and care about them and love them. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, and to give them peace, healing, if it's possible, O oh Lord. So, to be with us this morning, open our hearts and minds to you and, uh, and, and be with me as I try to present information about the wonderful world of angels. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, I'm always stuck with, you know, the truth is, by the time we're getting into this, it's already, what, 12 after 9, right? So it leaves me like with 40 minutes or so to do something with, you know. The truth is I have two hours of materials that, and, and, and so I made an executive decision. And that being, since I, there's not a way, any way possible that I could get to you the kind of information I have discovered and found and want to share with you, I am simply going to end when we have to end and pick up where I left off. Okay. Instead of saying there's there's uh, eight lessons here about angels in here, so we'll do a lesson a week. Well, truth is, I'll get maybe nicely started with lesson number one, and then to say, okay, let's do lesson two next week. When I really didn't do justice to lesson number one, it doesn't seem fair or right. So, if you can hang in with me there, I'll just end where I end, and then next week I'll pick up with where I ended, and maybe do some little reviewing, and and uh, and go on from there. Is that okay. Um, but you know, basically, we do want to try to do a lesson a week. Make sure uh, you you've reviewed lesson one. I remind you that in in the booklet, remember, read the introduction of it, look at lesson one, but the secret of all secrets that any teacher hesitates to tell their students that books are written, they're designed for reasons, they're designed to educate you, designed to, to be easy to use and so on. The answers to the questions are in the back. Don't look at them first, look at them second. Okay. Um, so, go ahead and look at lesson one for next time, and lesson two wouldn't hurt to look at that either. Uh, we'll see where we, we go. So, let's just recap a couple basic questions uh, about angels okay uh, so what's their job what's, what's what are angels supposed to do they were supposed to be messengers yeah the word it does lend itself to our word messenger okay messenger um, What kind of powers do they have? What do they do? If you think back to the stories in the Bible that contain angels in them, what what were the angels doing? Announcing. Announcing, right? Give me an example of where. Well, Mary, Mary. There you go. Mary. Elizabeth, right? Yes. With. <laughs> John the Baptist, with Mary, with Jesus, 
the angel is announcing something, he's telling them something, all right. Are there any places in the Bible where angels are fearful? They usually say, do not fear. They usually do, don't they? When they're talking to Ellie. Well, at Christmas when they talk to the shepherds. And talking to the shepherds, right? Fear not. Yeah. Yes, fear not. Yeah. Angels ever wipe anybody out? All right. Next week. The answer is yes. We'll take a look at that. But keep in mind that there are specific categories that God uses angels to do. It might be announcing. Okay? It might be guard. Guard duty. Right? Uh, it might be just a voice. How about worshiping God? It seems part of the misleading. It seems to be worshiping. Angels are like you and I are expected and do worship God or worship who else? Satan, Satan right? Yeah. There's a third, probably a third, the Bible tells us, of <clears throat> angels go with Satan. That's, that's one of the, that's the war. There literally is a war going on between the demons and the angels and God and Satan. There is right now. And the only reason the only reason that wonderful things happen to you, to our country, to your families, the blessings that you enjoy and have are because of what God and the angels do for us. Earth is a place <clears throat> where you have to make a decision. This is a lot of what I've been reading about, so I'll just jump into that. You might wonder, on Earth, there are wonderful things. You've experienced them in a huge way. You know, going living in Florida and enjoying that life there and so on is a great blessing to you coming home to family that you will do uh, next year. It will be a wonderful blessing to you two guys. At the same time, stuff happens. We get sick. We grow old. We die. We have family who have issues and trouble. We're hurt by some people, by what they say, by what they do, and so on. Earth is a place where you experience evil and good that's what it's about here and you have to make that decision in the near-death experiences I've been reading about okay people have to make a decision how do they make that decision well they make the decision because of life experiences right the, the good and the evil That's what, that's what life on earth is about, is, is, is confronting you with making those decisions and either being God's tool or somebody else's tool uh, and, and so on. But uh, let me read to you. They are his messengers when they give us strength or enlightenment. It is God's strength or enlightenment that they impart. Their encouragement is God's encouragement. Their guidance is God's guidance. Their protection is God's protection. When they bring comfort, it is God's comfort they offer. And when they bring wrath, which we'll talk about next week, it's God's wrath. Does an angel come to you or to me on his own? 
No. They're instructed by God. They're instructed by God. Let's take a look at how many of them there are. Okay. Now, you might look in your Bibles there at page 1,268. Those little grain or share. 1,268. Revelation 5, 11, 12. Here's one here. What's these about? Everybody okay? Five, eleven, and twelve. Now, would someone read Revelation five, eleven, and twelve from their Bible? Because I'm going to read after that from this Bible. Okay. Would someone like to do Debbie? Would you sure. do that for me? Or everybody, we're on. We're on. We're reading eleven and twelve. We're reading then I looked again, and I heard the singing of thousands and millions of angels around the throne, and the living beings and the elders. And they sang in a mighty chorus, The Lamb is worthy. The Lamb who was killed, he is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So how many angels are there? Yeah, it's just a little bit different here. Look at, listen to this one. This is uh, NIV. This is, I'm reading the same thing. Uh, you don't have this, but I'm, I'm reading it from the Bible my mother gave me. <laughs> same, same reading. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand. What's that number? 10,000 times 10,000. Come on, you mathematicians out there. I know you all got A's, man. It's a billion. It's a billion. It's a billion. Numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000, they encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Their job is to worship the Lord. Our job is to worship the Lord. Okay. But look at how many there are. In other words, you know, if somehow John could have counted them all, <coughs> would he have really gotten to a billion or one under or one over. There's just so many, they're countless, is what that means. Okay. So, how many angels there are? A lot. There's, there is a lot of them. Uh, let me ask you a couple <coughs> other questions, just to, because I just think if we just start the study of angels, we don't have kind of a, a lot of questions. Do you have questions? Let me just throw it to you. That you've always wondered about angels. I don't pretend to know every to know every answer. I do not. But I, we we together can answer. Do so there are any questions that you have about angels? I'm going to toss you out some. See if you have some knowledge of them. Because my daughter, I was just talking to her on the way here, and she's like. Do you think that angel? I said we're coming to the study. I said, do you think that angels are informed through humans, like they, that we can see them as a human being? So that is my question because I'm wondering: can they show up as a human being, or do they, or, or does the Holy Spirit tell us where to go? So I mean, can we actually see them as a human being, and then they just disappear? Well, there are times in the Bible when they are they are seen. Yes, they're they're visible. Right? And the answer is yes. Like, think back to the story of Abraham. Remember the story where Abraham, there's three individuals come to Abraham, right? 
we think that two are angels and one might be the Lord. Can they be seen? The answer is yes. Their spirits. Uh, I've always been fascinated by this. Rich, you're a scientist of sort, right? Of sort. <laughs> How many dimensions are there? Okay, there are at least ten. They said, "How many do you live in?" Three. I think. Right. Four, if you count nine. Four could be four. Yeah. <laughs> but there are ten. What would an angel be able to do? Experience them. Oh. What can you experience? Three or four. So, Mary Lou, the answer to your question is yes, they can appear in human form if that's what the Lord wants them to, to appear as. I'm convinced, this is Swanson theology, you've run into angels a lot. They are, I think they're around. Is there a guardian angel? We asked that last week. Is there a Teresa angel assigned to Teresa? The Bible doesn't directly say that. I guess if there were billions and, or billions and billions of angels, could be. But what do you have? living inside of you. What's inside of you? The Holy Spirit. Does God know when you need help? Yeah. Would God send an angel if that's what he wanted to do when you need help? Yeah. Yes. He might. Pardon? He might. Why might not? Depending upon? Things that we don't understand. Right. It's like pleading with the Lord. Uh, so I'll say pleading. You know, for, like for Carter and Nate. Right? Well, God might choose, might for His purposes, heal both of them. And God might not. As well. And this is God's will we're talking about. An angel can, on his own, do anything. Unless God directs it. Okay. Um, how many categories of angels are there? We did that last week. Thomas Aquinas says nine. That's according to Thomas Aquinas. And if you look up Thomas Aquinas, you'll actually have descriptions for each of the things that they're supposed to do. You're familiar with a few of them, seraphim and cherubim. Which angels are on the ark? There's two angels. <coughs> cherubim. The seraphim, cherubim. These are the winged ones. Archangels. Can you name an archangel? And it's the and just the regular angels, I guess these are the guys that maybe you've run into some mysteries. Can angels be working? Uh in their appearance to you, they tend to be male. Can you think of one that was female? Do they procreate? Do they have young? 
No. They don't. But they are a being, a created being, as we are created beings. The Bible will say, where do you rank in the angel rank? Where are you? Above them? Below them? A little less than the angels, the Bible says. Right now, what will you be? Yeah. Above them? Whose image are you created in? God's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, what I have heard, that makes you above the angels. Uh, How does Thomas Aquinas see? Dominions, virtues, powers, and principality as angels. He's naming them from what he's read in the Bible. Those are really his names for the powers that he felt were there. You can, if you look up how many categories of angels there are, it, it, there won't be agreement. <clears throat> I looked it up last night. I was looking, okay, let's just look at it a little bit more. And there's uh, some experts think that there are eight categories of angels. And among the eight categories of angels are, are the demonic crew. And they're numbered as <coughs> some of the eight and so on. So, right, so you're asking, Phil, what, how, how he gets the names? <coughs> I don't think of the a dominion as an individual. Yeah, but it's, sim it's simply because of their powers. Um, dominion, for example, says receives orders from seraphim and cherubim and keep things in order. Thomas Aquinas called that dominion. Remember, angels go past earth, go past human beings to everywhere. All of creation is God's work. And angels are helping to do that. Uh, principalities, according to Thomas Aquinas, oversee everything. Archangels appear in human form, manage the earthly duties of angels below them. Virtues maintain the natural world. Um, they run the area that scientists live in. There you are, Rich. Virtues. I, so I not I jotted them down. You can look them up. Look up Thomas Aquinas and and the uh, and the nine categories, and it does describe them. They're much more than what I'm giving to you. There's a greater description. Uh, seraphim means fiery ones, winged ones. What was Satan? A cherubim or a seraphim? He was a fallen angel. They, they believe he was a cherubim. So, but you see what I mean? The trouble I have with trying to. Want a couple more questions? angels age? No. They don't. Do they know everything? No. Like, do they know 
the day of the end time. Do angels know that? Who does? God and only God. All right. I, I, I just think it's important to review some basic questions. Um, about an angel's story. I read some to you last week. Here's another one. This is from my near-death experience a book about angels. It's a few paragraphs, so bear with me. 11-year-old Jennifer, she's 11, was in a severe car accident and left her body. She saw her limp and lifeless body below. A spiritual being told her, his nose is cut off, his face. You will need to go back and help him. He is bleeding to death. This is a voice, she said. Jennifer said, no, let somebody else do it. He'll be fine without my help. I do not want to go back down there. No. The voice said, I will tell you what to do. You take off his shirt. After you pick his nose up off the floorboard of the car, it will be next to your feet in his right foot. Place his nose on his face, pressing down to stop the bleeding. It's just blood, so do not be afraid. I remember Jennifer's alone. So then Jennifer, you will begin to walk him up the right side of the road and a car will come. Tell the man to take you to the nearest hospital. When Jennifer returned to her body, everything happened as she was told. A car stopped and carried them to the hospital. She was able to calm both the anxious driver and the man who lost his nose. And there was a happy ending. A skin graft was used to reattach the nose with barely a scratch left to notice. The astonished emergency room doctor said, I cannot explain what kind of miracle I just witnessed in this emergency room today. We know when evil, pain, or suffering hurt us, but we do not know how often God orchestrates his angels to care for us. Interesting angel story, isn't it? Um, let's take a look at our study guide booklet. We've got a roaring 10 minutes here, 12. And let's at least begin this. I am looking at lesson number one on page nine of your booklet. This story is going to take place that we're going to use here, and again, we'll just pick up with this next week, is from Isaiah chapter six, one through seven. The beginning here on page nine reads, during a particularly difficult year of my life, this is the author Douglas Connolly who wrote this, I experienced some profound and wonderful times of worship. Usually these came as my wife and I visited a church in our community for their midweek service. The believers began in a, with an extended time of singing praises to the Lord, a period of prayer followed. I often sat uh, through the whole service in tears of brokenness before God. I left in awe of the glory of God and with a transforming sense of his cleansing grace in my life. So when do you feel close to God? In prayer. In prayer. Anything else? In nature. When the sermon, occasionally. Always. Always? No. 
Well, also out in nature. In nature. In nature. Yeah. Yeah. In fellowship. In fellowship. How about communion? Do you get do you get chills or a tingling sensation in your back or neck? Sometimes I, I get it at communion. There's like a just a tingling thing. What do you think that is? Jim getting old. <laughs> I don't know. I like to think. I like to think it's the Holy Spirit. Among us there uh, as we each of us share communion and ask for God's forgiveness. Share his blood, he was by in the communion service and so on. Well, we're about to read an interesting time. This is Isaiah. How do you know? Do you know anything about Isaiah? Where, where have you heard Isaiah stuff? Christmas time. Yes, we use Isaiah at Christmas time. But Isaiah lived, and so we need to set this scene. I think I've been high enough to do this. Isaiah lived at a time that is tumultuous. Do you think this is a hard time in the United States and in the world? Yes, yes I do. Nothing compared to Isaiah. Uh, he lives in the 8th and 7th, he'll die in 681 BC. That's the 7th century BC. Okay, Probably born in uh, 765 BC dies 681 BC. Hang in with me. He lives at a time of great tumult. In 930 BC, Israel and Judah separated into two kingdoms. That's before, remember your number backwards, right? 930 BC, it's after Solomon, Israel and Judah divide into two kingdoms. Okay. They're coming apart at the seams because they are evil. They worship Baal. They, some of them, some of them practice uh, uh, infant sacrifice Baal I've taught you guys this before if you've been here they, many of them try to worship Baal and God at the same time Okay, Baal's statue uh, would be big like me or even bigger arms outstretched you build a fire it's hollow metal. We build a fire in Baal. It was red hot. And you take your infant and you put it on Baal's arms. <coughs> it, of course, dies. No wonder Israel and Judah fly apart, right? That's 930 B.C. God has had great patience with that. That's what was going on then. So, at the time that Isaiah lives, this is this is 765 B.C., so it's a, what, 160 years later. There still is Israel and Judah, and they're, they're mostly led by evil kings. 
Uzziah, U-Z-Z-I-A-H, was the ruler of Judah. Judah's two tribes, Israel is ten tribes. Israel is more evil than Judah, but they're both evil. But Uzziah was good, reigned 50 years. They did really well under him. And that was the time that Isaiah lived. But Uzziah begins to lose it. And he kind of, in essence, he believes he's greater than he is. And he offends the Lord. He, 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 he performs a, a, a ritual and and he is struck with leprosy and he dies five years later about 740 BC is the story that Isaiah that we're about to read here now what you do need to understand is that Israel, be, at the, the time of Isaiah, Israel, the ten tribes, are wiped off the face of the map. So I just, I'm just telling you all this so that you can appreciate the, the tumult of the time that Isaiah lived in. Okay? And he's, a, he's he, he becomes a prophet in the reading that we're about to do and we'll do next week. Okay? By 722, during Isaiah's time, okay, uh, Israel will fall to the Assyrians. So you can imagine that. Now, when I say fall to the Assyrians, I mean destroy. I mean people impaled outside of their homes, outside of their cities. Horrible. Do you ever hear the word 10 lost tribes of Israel? That's how bad it is. They're gone. Many of them are hauled away. A lot of them are hauled away to Assyria. So the, the Jews that we know today are from what kingdom? Israel or Judah? Judah. Two tribes. That's what Isaiah is part of. So that's all during this particular lifetime okay so uh, keep in mind the tumult of the time and I say Isaiah is, is, is a fond follower of Uzziah the king and when we read this next week I hope you remember some of that that I just told you the reading of uh, Isaiah which is what six one to seven, right? Yeah. That's what's on Isaiah's mind at the time that the reading will take place. So go ahead and do the reading. And obviously I didn't get through lesson one, did I? I hope that's all right with you guys. I'll pick up with with this and the reading. That's where we'll start next week after I show you the wrath that some angels carried out. I'll probably start with that. Then we'll do lesson one. I promise you I'll do every effort to get through lesson one uh, next week. Okay? So I much appreciate your being here. Thank you for coming today. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. We're truly amazed, oh Lord, at, at you how wonderful you are and how much you love us to have created all this really so that so that we might be with you one day and serve you and worship you thank you for the angels that, that help us that defend us that do things for us that defend us forgive us for our shortcomings Please be with those people, both young and old, and on our prayer list, and, and others that aren't on our prayer list, 
there are wars in, in the world, O oh Lord. There are people suffering. We ask that you be with them. You help us to, to help them. So make this church a beacon on a hill. Make it an example for others to follow, O oh Lord. Use us to make a difference. And bring us together next week as we continue our learning effort here and learn more and more about angels and what they do for us because of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks everybody. Thank you.